Hi everyone, so my name is Andrew and I'll be talking to you about the frame today. Uh, so, most basic thing, I think everyone here probably knows what I'm talking about, but a frame or people generally call it a chassis, but sometimes chassis also includes the suspension. So I'm only going to be talking about the structure that everything on the car is attached to, so I'll just stick to the word frame here. And that's pretty much what a frame is, that was last year's frame. So I was going to talk to you a little bit today about how you go about designing the frame. Uh, there's, these are the basic constraints. Uh, we have to meet the rules, which are mostly about driver safety. Uh, there's a matter of packaging everything, so suspension, fitting a driver, fitting the engine, those are sort of the major things. Uh, the main objectives for the frame are for weight and stiffness. Those are the two parameters that are really going to affect vehicle performance. So it pretty much needs to be as light as possible. And stiffness can be a bit more complicated. Uh, it also needs to be manufacturable, especially for a uh, competition like ours, since we're building it ourselves. And repairable, since we're not really experienced designers, so things usually break at competition. Or, well, ideally during testing. And lastly, it needs to be somewhat inexpensive, whether it be for the cost report or for the fact that we actually have to get material and build it ourselves. Uh, so, with these in mind, I thought I'd go over a few different types of frames. Uh, so, uh, last year we had a space frame. Uh, those are some of the advantages. It's very easy to access all different components. Uh, if you make it out of steel, it is uh, repairable. Uh, you just weld in new tubes and anything breaks. Um, I call it the most structurally efficient. Uh, that's because for a race car, most of the loads are going to be point loads when you think about it. So whether it be the suspension, uh, all the suspension lengths are kind of like two-fourths members, so you just have point loads everywhere. Uh, for seat belts, for the driver harness, those are all kind of like point loads. Uh, even like the engine mount, you might have like six engine mounts, so you've only got loads really going in one direction. Um, so in that sense, can sort of make the tubes follow the, those different load paths. Uh, so that's why I call it most structurally efficient. I'll get into that a bit more later. Uh, and lastly, for a space frame, you can actually use a few different materials. You can even make, make it out of carbon fiber tubes. Uh, but that would be pretty difficult for most Formula SAE teams. Uh, this year, we're hoping. Oh, yeah, and those are. Some pictures of manufacturing of the space frame. You need to notch, to make it of steel tubes of glass, you need to notch all the tubes. Uh, last year we got the tubes laser cut. Uh, you need to jig it, so you need to have some way of placing those tubes. And I guess obviously then you need to weld it. So those are a few manufacturing pictures. Another type of frame is the monocoque. So that's what we're going to be using this year. It's sort of like a one-piece shell-like structure, or a tub, if you want. Um, they're generally made with sandwich panels. So a uh, sandwich panel looks like that. Uh, you sort of have two skins. They could be carbon fiber with something to space those two apart. The further you space those skins apart, the stiffer your panel will be, as shown here. Uh, so the stiffness pretty much increases 37 times if you increase the thickness four times. So that's sort of why it's so efficient. And we often use carbon fiber for those skins. Uh, that's a picture of unidirectional prefab. So carbon fiber can either be unidirectional, where you have all your fibers going one direction, like in that picture, or it can make some sort of weave. Uh, one weave is called texturing, and it kind of looks like that. You've got a bunch of fibers going in one direction, weaved over the others. Often you have uh, weaves like this, uh, but with a weave like this, the fibers aren't quite as straight, as you can sort of see from that picture. So there's some advantages and disadvantages to the different materials you choose. Uh, also, manufacturing monocoque could be somewhat difficult, maybe more difficult than a space frame. You need to make molds. Uh, this year, our plan is to start by making a male mold of, say, the outside of that 
monocoque shell that you saw. Although, since you'll need to cure it, uh, usually in high temperatures, because uh, when you use carbon fiber, you also have to use something called resin uh, that basically holds the virus in place, and you need to cure that at high temperature so that it hardens. So you can't really use something that's machinable, like a material like that, which is sort of like a wooden material. So you need to make another mold from that mold. So generally, you start by making a male mold, then you can make a female mold out of something like carbon fiber that can be used at those high temperatures. And once you have that mold, you can then start cutting material for your actual chassis and you can lay it up in the mold. Uh, sometimes in aerospace they'll use laser projection machines to orient certain plies at different angles. And then once you've laid it up in your mold, you can cure it in an enclave. So that's sort of a brief overview of how that works. And you can't really make it in one piece usually, so people try to make it in at least two parts, so that's sort of what that looks like. Uh, and I mentioned that repairability is important for FSE. Uh, it's usually pretty difficult to repair things out of composite materials, but it is possible. So that is a bit of a drawback of choosing a monocoque. One other type of framework that I'd mentioned is the aluminum monocoque, which I guess was popular in Formula One in the 70s. And that has aluminum face sheets with probably some kind of honeycomb core. Uh, so one other important thing to design a frame is that you need to do some kind of analysis. Uh, I mentioned that there's the whole like driver safety thing that's important. You need to make sure that it's strong enough so that if you get into a crash, that I guess uh, the driver will be protected. Or you need to make sure that it's durable so that whatever loads are on it during the season uh, don't result in things breaking. Um, so typically, since it's such a complicated structure, we can do some time calculations, but we often use sort of a, something called finite element analysis, which looks like that. It's kind of difficult to explain, uh, but you can pretty much, I guess it's sort of something you learn in your courses, so I won't actually get into too much detail there, but uh, you pretty much use like, kind of like discretize the structure into a bunch of small parts. And on those you can use like the equations of equilibrium and things like that. And using that you can figure out how much things will deflect or how much stress you'll have in certain materials and things like that. So that's sort of a useful tool that we use. Uh, and last year something that was cool was we made a model that looks like this of, of the frame and we included the suspension. And to validate that, we did some physical testing. Uh, I mentioned that stiffness is important to a frame. Uh, one particular type of stiffness that's important is called torsional stiffness. So if you were to, say, twist the front axle, so here there's like a, a weight uh, on each side, but there's a pulley mechanism so that you kind of apply a torque at the front axle, and here the rear hubs are fixed, you can get a load like that uh, in a corner. And so it turns out the frame needs to be fairly stiff. Otherwise, that'll, the system of your frame will affect your load transfer in the front rear, rear and could cause understeer or, or oversteer. So that's why torsional stiffness is, is important. So we did a physical test of last year's frame to find out what that torsional stiffness was. And then we compared it to our simulation. Uh, in the physical test, we did just like in that picture, and we applied a torque in the front and kept the rear fixed. And to figure out how much the frame was twisting at different points, we put these long steel bars, and I don't know if you can see it, but at each end we put dial leaders. So from that, we can figure out how much the frame was twisting. And we did that at several points along the length of the car. So basically here, 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 and here. And then we made a plot of how much it twisted versus the position, if you want. Uh, so, the curve in red shows the simulation results, and the curve in black is the actual test results. So they're actually relatively close. In the rear, there's a lot of error, because I didn't include the, the engine in the model, and the engine actually still the frame quite a bit. 
But for the whole frame, you can get a value for the torsional thickness, and they're up there at the top left. So they're relatively close, given that the model is pretty simplified. Uh, another thing we have to do is, especially this year since we want to use a monocoque, uh, it's very difficult to get material properties for things like carbon fibers, so we do some material testing. Uh, that's a picture from last year. And then we can use values from those material tests in our FE model and so forth. Uh, there's also, at the front of the car, there's something called an impact generator. So if you get in a head-on crash, uh, this absorbs energy and decelerates the car more slowly. So last year we tested a bunch of different ones. Uh, you can test it either like this, so you just crushed it very slowly. And after, or you can test it dynamically. Uh, in this case, we dropped a fair amount of weight and figured out how much energy that would take. And we attached an accelerometer to the weights to figure out what sort of deceleration there would be. So that would be a weight similar to what the car would be. And that's sort of a mock-up of impact generator and the front of the car from last year. You can see the brackets for the wings included in the test. Uh, that's sort of another picture of uh, a dynamic sled test that you do for the front suspension points in the front and rear where things are going to be connected. So we have like a AR on the front with the front. How would we push around? So I mentioned before that Most of the loads on the car are kind of like point loads, so here the loads from the arms are all kind of in the direction of these different lengths, so it's one thing to consider when you're designing it. Uh, the other thing is you have to have a front hoop and a main roll hoop going through the rules, so if you get in a roller here, uh, there has to be this sort of like roll hoop. So that's the main roll hoop and the front roll hoop. According to the rules, they have to be steel no matter what kind of frame you use. And you have to have a steel main hoop bracing. So that's the main hoop bracing. Uh, the other thing is you have to have some sort of front bulkhead, it's called. Um, Usually, to this front bulkhead, you attach some kind of impact attenuator to get into a crash. Uh, so then, it's sort of a matter of connecting some of these dots. And, yeah, so then, you have to have a cockpit that has to be open to fit the driver. And once again, you can get some points at the rear. And before you know it, you'll have a frame more or less. <laughs> you also have to have what's called a side and back structure uh, to make sure that nothing can intrude into the cockpit during crash, so you can have some diagonals, something like that. And the only other thing is you might want to have this, some of these major load loop points, like where the suspension connects, well triangulated. Uh, that turned out to be a little bit harder to draw than I thought. <laughs> but that's sort of the gist of it. Uh, yeah, and then a lot of these things, the rules are going to fill in. And you just have to consider a few other things, like the driver's seatbelt would have to be connected somewhere, so you might want to add a bar here in the middle of the main hoop. There's uh, an engine at the rear somewhere, so you'd have to fit that in. And generally, if you've taken even a course just like Mechanics 1, you know that a uh, space frame is most efficient if all the tubes are only in tension or compression. So you ideally want to have things at nodes, 
and not say right in the middle of a tube. And even if it's the same for a monocoque also, uh, the load's still going to travel in the same directions, so it's sort of a thing to consider. Good question. Yeah. Do I Yes, please. Oh, okay. Um, all right. For the monocoque design, are there places that have sort of that are more hollow or less thick? Yeah. I'm saying like, th does it make sort of that kind of design? But yeah, it makes it makes sense sort of to you could change the number of like uh, skins they have in different regions. You could change the core thickness. You could also put unidirectional carbon fibers along certain directions. So this year we're planning to put unidirectional carbon fiber where some of the tubes were last year. Since like the load is still gonna travel on those paths. Is there, uh, is there a lot more analysis that you need for a uh, common frame than for a uh, space frame? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I didn't mention it, but there's two sets of rules you design a frame to. There's the baseline rules, like what we used last year, where they specify, say, like, outer diameters and wall thicknesses for all the tubes. And if you use the baseline rules for a monocoque, you have to show that your, I guess, sandwich panels in those regions have the same properties as the steel tubes that are in the rules. So if the rules say they have a one inch on five tube, you have to show that your sandwich panel uh, has the same like, stiffness and bending or ultimate strength and tension. You can do that with hand calculations. But this year, we're using the alternate frame rules. And those are actually seven load cases. Uh, things like a rollover situation or uh, for, say, where the harness attaches. and. For that, you have to do FEA to show that you can pass those load cases. So this year, there will be more FEA for that reason. But yeah, that's the only reason why we'd have a lot more simulation this year. Not really so much just because of the monocoque. If you want to show off your... And for the alternate variables, you have to submit something called a notice of intent. So the SAE has a sample space frame on their website. And this year, we submitted that notice of intent so that we can do the ultimate frame rules, and we analyzed their sample frame under those seven load cases. Like this report was submitted last Friday. So this frame here is not our frame. It's a f like a frame that the rule committee like gave us to analyze. And then they see, you know, are we competent in our, our analysis? Like, can they trust the analysis that we're going to give them? Um, February for the actual frame we're designing right now. And if you're doing a monocoque, you have to put two constant panels in that frame. So I model them here with 2D shell elements, and the panels are in the side back structure and right there. Uh, so for those of you who are there for uh, for Philip's presentation on uh, FEA, this is a good example of how you can combine different kinds of elements into a finite element analysis. So like Andy just said, uh, we're using like these one-dimensional idealized beam elements to model all of the tubes, and then the panels are actually these 2D elements, so they're like little squares. Yeah, and that's one of the little cases 